Welcome to Dayspring Fellowship. It's a great day to get together to explore and discover what God has for each of us in these next few moments. He's always doing something new, drawing us closer, deepening our spiritual roots, and making us a little more like Jesus. Even when His work is behind the scenes and we don't get to see instant results, we can trust that He is at work and His work is always good. I'm Chris Voigt, and I lead the team here at Dayspring. We're in the business of helping people figure out what it looks like to become more like Jesus in their lives. We love to help people figure out the next step on their spiritual journey. Since you are people, that means you. We're praying for you. If you're visiting Dayspring today, we want you to know that we are a come-as-you-are kind of church. We're a church of good old regular people. People trying to clean up their messy lives one step in the right direction at a time. Which means that no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, this is a good place to be in process, figuring it out. We haven't arrived yet, so we can be good company on the journey. Even if you aren't sure the Christian life is a journey you want to be on, this is a good place to ask questions as you look for answers. So welcome. You can learn more about us as a church by exploring our website at dsf.church, by checking out our Facebook page, or contacting us by phone or email. If you need help figuring out the next step to making Dayspring your home church, or if you have questions, let us know. We'll help you find the answers. For today's service, you can find a discussion guide by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. Now, let's join our service. I think, I think I lost sleep for about three days because of it. Uh, it played in the soundtrack of my mind on an endless loop, undermining God's good work in my life, making me feel less than as a Christ follower, not good enough as a pastor, making me feel misguided, questioning my call. It stole a little of the joy and love from something I had been working on for a very long time. And the longer the endless loop played, the bigger it got, the more power it had over me. It didn't matter that I knew that what he'd said to me wasn't true. It didn't didn't matter that I understood completely that what he'd said to me was only his opinion. And while an opinion might be true for you, that doesn't mean it is true for everyone else. Uh, You know, it didn't even matter that I knew that everything he'd said had its root in his own insecurities. Everything he'd said was said to make me understand how, how thoughtful and cool he was, covering up the fact that he was really just looking for my approval. None of that mattered. Because once Satan got a hold of that endless loop playing in my head, the enemy of my soul had a field day for three days. Have you ever been there? Someone has said something to you and then your brain just goes on autopilot. That endless loop starts playing. You aren't good enough. You'll never be good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not committed enough. You're not man enough or woman enough, not mom enough or dad enough. Anyone else? (laughs) Words have power. Words have incredible power over our lives and in our lives. They, They have the power to fill us with joy, to inspire us to create, to love more deeply. Words have the power to give us hope, to spur us on to greatness. Words have the power to help us become. Why is it that those kinds of words don't run on the endless loop in our heads? Why is it that the words that carve ruts as they loop through our brains over and over and over, sometimes year after year, why is it that those words are always negative, destructive, Soul sucking. This time, the endless loop only played for three days. I'm getting better. Usually it's longer. But then in my quiet time, in my, in my spirit, I heard God speak the words, take those thoughts captive. 
And it, it dawned on me that Satan was having a field day and it was time to put a stop to his evil ways. Bringing on another endless loop. You should know better by now. Why did it take you so long? Will you never learn? Okay, I made that part up. <laughs> this time. Welcome to week two of Harnessing the Power of Words. This month, we're looking to exert a little more control over that flame of fire we call a tongue. I think my wife, Dee Dee, my biggest supporter, the love of my life, my best friend, yeah, that Dee Dee, summed up pretty well how most of us feel about this topic. When she found out about the series, her first thought was, can I skip church this month? <laughs> she isn't, for the record. I think most of us wish everybody else would learn a little bit of tongue control, but leave me alone. I'm just fine. And yet, here we all are, trying to become like Jesus with every fiber of our being, including our tongue, which the good news is, as we learned last week, if we can learn to control our tongue, it will mean that we've learned to control lots of of the rest of us too. Tongue control is a symptom of God's control over our heart. It's a symptom of what's already happened in our heart. So tongue control is a sign of maturity on our spiritual journey. Of course, with good news, usually comes bad news. The other side of that one is that the lack of tongue control is a symptom of a heart problem on our part, a lack of surrender. So there is that. Here's the deal. We, we, we talk about this one a lot. Jesus left us with one command. We talk about it a lot because there is only one to talk about. If Jesus had given us more commands, then we'd branch out. But he didn't. So here we are uh, in, the, in the last few moments of his time with the disciples. Just before he was arrested, he laid out the ground rules well, in this case, since there was only one, the ground rule. This is what it means to follow Jesus. He said, I'm going away. You can't come with me right now. So in the meantime, I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. That's it love each other. We prove our love for Jesus by the way we love each other. Whenever there is any question about what to do, we just have to ask ourselves, what does love require of me in this moment? That's, that's it. It's easier said than done, of course, but the, that problem is on us. It's not on Jesus. And since the way we love each other always in, seems to include the need to speak to each other, the way we speak to each other matters. Words matter. So what does love require that I say or not say in this moment? Last week, we looked at what James, the half-brother of Jesus and leader in the church uh, in Jerusalem, had to say about our words as a sign of our Christian maturity. This week, we're going to go straight to the source and see what Jesus had to say. So if you've brought your Bible with you in any form, turn or navigate to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12. We're going to pick it up in verse 33, but first let's get some context. Uh, this section of Matthew begins with Jesus healing a blind and mute demon-possessed man in front of a whole crowd of people, most of whom are amazed at what they've just seen. I say most because, as usual, there are some Pharisees in the crowd. And since the Pharisees aren't really all that fond of Jesus and feel threatened by him, they do what most of us do when someone we don't like does something awesome. They get snarky. And they attribute his power to Satan, wherein Jesus explains to them how that really isn't possible, given what's just happened. And he draws a line in the sand telling everyone that anyone who isn't with him is against him. And in one of the more misunderstood verses in the entire New Testament, he warns them about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. 
Now, why this verse is misunderstood is another topic for another day. But we need to know that he is talking to the Pharisees here. And as we slide into verse 33, he is still talking to the Pharisees. And while what he says is true for us as well and is supported in other places in Scripture, when you're doing a topical study of a subject, context matters. We want to align our lives to the Word of God, not align the Word of God to our lives. Too many people find verses to to support whatever they want supported without regard to context, which is a dangerous practice that leads many people down discouraging and even sinful roads. So, As we pick up what what Matthew reports Jesus said, Jesus is directing his comments to the Pharisees as he describes the state of their hearts. He says, a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of vipers, you brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. So again, while these specific words are directed at the Pharisees, we can rightly apply them to the principle to our own lives. Because the principle is also supported in other places in the Bible. In fact, in just a few chapters after another interaction with the Pharisees, we read, then Jesus called to the crowd to come and hear. Listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. So here he turns his attention from the Pharisees to the crowd and he makes this a, this principle applies to everybody teaching moment. And in just a few verses down in verse 18, he reiterates this thought. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. Your words which begin in the heart reveal what's going on in your heart. So while Jesus' words back in chapter 12 are directed at the Pharisees, I think we can safely apply them to ourselves as well. Good words come from, a, from good hearts, and bad words come from bad hearts. Okay, now back in chapter 12 now, Jesus does the same thing as he continues in verse 36. He turns his attention from the Pharisees to the crowd. It gets lost in translation, but as we just saw in chapter 15, what Jesus says next is directed to everyone. He continues, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Now, someday you will have to give an account for every idle word you speak. Uh, The New American Standard Bible translates the word idle as careless. We will have to give account for every careless word we speak. That should be a sobering thought. And for the rest of this message, I want to camp out on that idea. Our careless words. Now, let me, let me start here. Even though this isn't what Jesus meant, this is another one of those consistent with the whole of Scripture moments, when it comes to careless words, we do speak words, usually in the heat of the moment, where we could care less about the impact of those words. You know, you're right in the middle of a fight, they've pushed you to the edge, and your words become the weapons of your warfare. You're dropping bombs, and the only care you have in the moment is that you care that your words hurt the other person. You intend for them to hurt. There is an intentionality to the way that you are speaking. Now, we don't really need to unpack this much. We all know that this is a big no-no. Love never requires us to be uncaring about the impact of our words. In fact, just the opposite is true. Love requires kindness at all times. There is no place in Scripture that allows Christ followers to be unkind in any way, including our words. 
the apostle Peter said it this way. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. From God's perspective, unkind speech ranks up there with other evil deeds. Just say no. Now that doesn't mean that it's not okay to get angry. Anger is a valid emotion. We get in trouble by what we say and do when we get angry. Love requires us to still act like Jesus when we are angry. Again, no exceptions in Scripture. So figure it out, people. We will talk in the coming weeks about hard conversations. So maybe we'll have some help to offer if that's a challenging area for you. But for our point here, we are never allowed to care less about the impact of our words. Now, what Jesus is talking about here is the words that we are careless with, that have unintentional impact. In the original language, they are lazy words. We are lazy in using them. They are literally shunning the labor they ought to perform. We are, we're careless about their impact. Let's look at careless through the, the lens of Proverbs. Proverbs 10 says, The words of the godly are a life-giving fountain. Careless words aren't that. They aren't life-giving, but they aren't a fountain. The words of the wicked conceal violent intentions. I, even if they're only neutral, that's not life-giving. Uh, back to the subject of kindness, Proverbs 16 says that kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Again, careless words aren't that. They might not be the opposite of honey, whatever that is. Maybe like sucking on a lemon or eating Brussels sprouts. <laughs> but careless words are not honey. Uh, even back in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells the Thessalonian church, so encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. So obviously careless words don't meet this criterion either. I like to process, process things visually when I can. And so let's, let's try to illustrate careless words this way. This line represents me, the totality of me, all that I am in my inner man. Uh, you have a line too, so you can think of your line as I illustrate this with mine. When it comes to my own understanding of myself, there are some things that I am pretty confident in. I know I can sing. I don't claim to have the best voice in the world, but I know that I can sing. I know that I'm a good grandpa. I don't claim to be the best grandpa in the world, but I knew, do know that I am the best pops for Avery. I'm also pretty secure as Dee Dee's husband. Uh, even more important than these, I am pretty darn solid as a child of the king. Now, just to be clear, none of this is arrogance. Humility is a right understanding of oneself. So you can state something positive like this and still be walking in humility. It is an emotionally healthy understanding of myself in these areas. You have them too. You might have more than me. You might have less than me. Let's call these positive securities. On the other end of the spectrum, there are some things that I know are not true about myself. On the physical side, I know that I am not six foot six, and I will never be six foot six. I also know that I'm not your stereotypical macho man. I know that I do not have what it takes to be a rocket scientist. Uh, even as a pastor, I know that I do not have all of the credentials that some pastors have. I'm not putting myself down as a pastor. I think I'm a pretty good one, but I don't have a seminary degree. I might someday, but not now. Now, none of those things are good or bad in and of themselves. They just are, and that's okay. I am secure with that. Just as I am sure it will rain again in the Willamette Valley at some point in the near future, I'm sure you have your list as well. 
Again, this is based on a healthy emotional understanding of myself. So let's call these negative securities. Before we go on, let's just acknowledge that neither side is static, which would mean that they don't change. They do change. When I was 20, I hated to talk in front of people. I loved to sing and lead worship, but I wasn't a public speaker. So at that time, public speaking would have hit a negative security. Over time, as God has grown me up, that has changed and it's moved toward the right. Someday, life will change and I will not be able to sing the same way that I can right now. I'm sure that that will mean a journey to the left. We are different people at different seasons in our lives. We often hit transition points that readjust our positive and negative securities. When people retire, they often have a period of adjustment. As people age, it's common to have to adjust your securities. My mother-in-law had the spiritual gift of helps. She loved being a blessing to others by helping them in tons of different ways. But her diabetes and the blindness that came with it changed her ability to express herself that way. Before she died last year, she struggled identifying positive securities. That's pretty common. The older you get, life looks different and you have to adjust and learn new skills and let go of some old ones. Though it would be great if, if we just always stayed secure, God uses transitions of all kinds to keep us becoming like Jesus. Which leaves us with the middle. When it comes to the middle, there are some things that I'm pretty sure are true about myself, that I hope are true about myself, that I want to be true ab about myself, or that I hope aren't true about myself, but that I don't want to be true of myself. Some things, uh, some things that are in transition, like we've already talked about, some of those are positive and some of them are negative. So let's call them positive and negative insecurities. Does this make sense so far? I hope so because we've come too far to turn back now. <laughs> Ideally, on our spiritual journey, the more we align our lives with Jesus, the smaller the insecurity section gets. Our security with Jesus, in Jesus, puts the insecurities in their proper place. This is what happens with emotionally healthy followers of Christ, which is why we look at our spiritual growth holistically here at Dayspring. Emotional health impacts spiritual health and vice versa. And somewhere in there, our physical being comes into play as well. Okay, so let's focus on the insecurity area for a moment. This is our danger zone. This is where that endless loop does damage. This is where I'm not enough lives. This is where I'll never measure up compares me to others. This is where, just wait until they find out the truth, tries to make me hide like I'm an imposter. Nobody wants me has found a home in the danger zone. I'm a failure, I'm too broken, I'm unworthy, I don't belong, or maybe I'm too old or too young. I have nothing to contribute. There's no way God could ever love me, want me, use me. I, I guess it would be impossible to list everything that runs on our endless loop. We all have our own soundtrack. This is where care less and careless words frolic freely in my mind and in yours. Now, as a side note, what's interesting is that most of the positive and negative secure insecurities, most of the positive and negative securities when we are less spiritually mature are focused on what we can do or can't do, while our positive and negative insecurities are focused on who we are or are not, our identity. As Christ does his good work in our lives, as we mature, much of that reverses. We become more and more secure in who we are at, and even as what, what we bring to the table shifts according to the seasons of our life. Okay, so back to our danger zone, our insecurities. There is some good news. The good news is you are not alone. 
I don't care what it looks like from the outside. Every single person has a soundtrack just like yours. I have never met anyone, and I mean that. No one has successfully erased every track on the eight track that is their mind. For those of you who are too young to know what an eight track is, Google it later. It's old school. So that's the good news. You are not alone. We are all working out our faith with fear and trembling, working to align our lives with Jesus, and none of us has arrived. But as is true, every time someone says, that's the good news, <laughs> there's also bad news. And the bad news is that this, is, this area is Satan's playground. I'm pretty sure he's the one who keeps pressing play on our negative soundtracks over and over and over and over and over. For the record, he can't read our minds. That ability is reserved for God alone. But he's been studying human behavior for thousands of years, and so he can read us like a book. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us not to let anger give the devil a foothold in our lives. I think it's safe to, to say that that's true in this area of our lives as well. Don't give the devil a foothold. Since we spend more time with ourselves than anybody else, let's just address the careless words that come from within. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments, which is what all that junk is. False arguments, human reasoning. We, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. I memorized this from the NIV translation years ago. It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up from the knowledge of God. We demolish those destructive soundtracks and we teach them to obey Christ which means that we replace the lies with the truth of God's word. That's the weapon of our warfare, the best tool in our arsenal. And here's the thing, as much as our endless loops are a curse, they are also a gift. They tell us something about ourselves. They, they tell us, they reveal an area of our lives that God wants to speak into and bring healing. This is really important. Don't let that statement slip by in this moment. God wants to shine light in those dark areas of our minds. So don't be afraid of the endless loops. Invite him into them. Ask him to reveal the deeper fears and insecurities that give them life, just as they steal your life. Whatever runs on your endless loop or loops, invite God to heal that brokenness as he aligns your mind to truth and then find truth from God's word and begin to play that over and over and over. Don't give the devil a foothold. Now, all of that inside voice stuff is just bonus material today. I'm throwing it in because I love you and want to help you become like Jesus from the inside out. But that brings us to the kinds of careless words Jesus is talking about. Now, it's hard enough to keep me straight most of the time. But since we're talking about the careless words that we speak to others, we have to add you into the equation. Now, I probably don't need to say this, but I will. Someone will misunderstand this illustration and think I've written a sermon all about Chris Voigt. I've used me as an example only because I didn't want to out anyone else's insecurities. In real life, you are me. And all but one of you have already figured that out, connected the dots, so let's keep at it. Years ago, Michael walked up to me after the service. I was standing back at the sound booth as people walked out, and he came right up to me and he said, this is a direct quote, I hate the way you sing now. Because it's never okay to be unkind, I looked at him and said, I'm sorry, Michael. And he continued on out. 
what else could I do? Singing hits my positive security section. I didn't lose any sleep over his opinion. Satan couldn't even touch that one. I was genuinely sorry that Michael didn't like my voice, but it is what it is. And I'm, I'm good with that. I'm secure. Years ago, when we were first married, Dee Dee and I were sitting across the table from our, our pastor and his wife. And at one point in the conversation, she looked at me and she said, maybe music isn't your gift. <laughs> Again, no impact. Thanks for playing. Would you like to try for double jeopardy? <laughs> uh, on the other hand, before I became the lead pastor here, someone who should have known better said to me, Chris, I can't affirm your teaching gift. Now, this one was a little harder. As I've already told you, had he said it when I was 20, I would have laughed in his face and said, neither can I. But I wasn't 20. At the time, I felt pretty secure about my teaching gift. It was certainly on the positive insecurity side of things. So the devil got a foothold for a season. When it comes to our words, do we really want to give the devil a foothold in someone else's life? I think careless words are the ones the devil uses to loop those negative soundtracks that run in our minds. And we carelessly bandy them around, bandy our words around, unaware of the damage that we are doing to someone else. We will have to give an account for those words. Now, for those of you that have your defenses up, yes, it is true that people are responsible for their own soundtracks. We barely understand ourselves enough to avoid the negative impact on ourselves, let alone others. I get that. I mean, even when it looks like someone's finally got their act figured out, they hit a transition point and have to start again. So how can we ever know what triggers someone else's soundtrack? We can't. Which is why we must be careful with our words. Never careless. Nobody wants to unintentionally send another person spiraling. That would break most of our hearts, as it should. That is what's required of love. So let's think about what it means to be careful with our words. Careful words don't impact, they influence. That's what we want to do. We want to influence others. The, uh, the author of Hebrews put it this way. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. The, the NIV says to consider how we may spur one another on. To think of ways is to be careful, intentional influence. We've already looked at several verses that support this principle. Uh, Proverbs 10.11, Proverbs 16.24, 1 Thessalonians 5.1. But let's also consider Colossians 4.6. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Gracious and attractive. Speak the kinds of words that will make people come back for more. So let's get practical. Three things. First, be positive. Keep it positive. Since you don't know what kinds of negative things might trigger someone else's negative loop, don't be negative. Which is harder than it seems, especially in our culture right now. There's lots of negative to spout off about. So don't. Be positive. Change the subject to a positive subject. Unless you are having an intentional, redeeming conversation about something negative that you have been invited to speak into, just be positive. And even then, choose your words wisely. There is a way to speak life in every situation. So speak life. Second, be careful with your opinions. 
Women, you are fantastic about making comments about what other women are wearing. Maybe you shouldn't be quite so good at it. When you say, I don't think a Christian woman should wear leggings, to a woman with 15 pair of leggings in her closet, what do you think that careless remark does in her? I don't know how any Christian could, could be a Republican right now or a Democrat right now. Is your opinion, keep it to yourself. It isn't uplifting to anyone. Every time you bemoan the state of our schools, you steal life from good men and women who are stuck in a system that is impossible right now. The system is the problem, not most of the teachers. Don't be careless. Especially stay away from uninvited opinions about another person's life. You shouldn't do that. Well, what if God is calling them to do that? Or, I would never have fallen for that, says... You were stupid when you clicked that link. You don't know what you would fall for or not in the same situation, so just keep your opinion to yourself. And if you are asked, choose your words carefully. There are so many other things that are life-giving. You could talk about them. And then last, become a cheerleader. Nobody needs you to point out their mistakes. Nobody needs your help identifying their flaws. Nobody needs you to shine a light on their weaknesses. Our inner voices have that one down pat, running on an endless loop. Learn to cheer people on to the truth. Encourage, praise, motivate. Help them gain a Jesus-centered perspective. And if you can't do that, maybe shut up. <laughs> like, do you know what the world would look like if we could become people who are known for our kind words? Talk about light in the darkness. A kind word delivered with a smile could be the only bit of Jesus someone sees today. Wouldn't you like to deliver that? Wouldn't you like to be the one who speaks Jesus into someone else's life? So be positive. Be careful with your opinions and become a cheerleader. Be careful, intentionally careful. That's what love requires. Let's pray. Father, I, because I know myself and I know my friends here well enough to know uh, this, none of us has to, to think far to find places in our lives where we're careless with our words, with people that we're careless with our words with. Teach us not to be careless. Teach us to be careful. Teach us to keep love in mind, to keep the best in mind, to assume the best and to speak the best. Give us wisdom and insight as we talk with people. Help us identify ways to spur them on toward love and good deeds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Let me encourage you to download the discussion guide by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. Working through those questions alone or with others will help the truth of God's Word find its place in your life. Please reach out if you have any questions or want help on your spiritual journey. My email address is on the screen, or you can call the church during the week. This ministry is made possible because of people like you, people who believe in what God is doing through Dayspring. Your financial generosity is evidence of God's work in your life. If you're just checking us out today, please know that we don't expect you to give anything to support Dayspring. That is a responsibility of our Dayspringers. Just enjoy the rest of your day. If you'd like to start giving, we have three easy ways for you to get us your gift. 
please see the online giving section of our website or text GIVE to the number on your screen or mail a check to us at the address you'll find on our website. Also, thank you for liking and sharing and following Dayspring on whatever platform you are on, maybe even rating us where that is appropriate. It is really encouraging to me when you share something that has impacted you through this service with someone else. Until we meet again, may the God of all peace give you peace at all times and in every situation.